Izzy now and welcome to the Wheelie Man YouTube channel. My name's John and today I'm mostly going to be talking about my experience with HSCT. In this video I'm going to be talking about HSCT, uh, how to get on board and the steps I went through to prepare for it. Uh, HSCT is potentially a way of halting MS. Technically, it's a HSCT. Um, it's autologous, um, which means that the cells come from the patient. The failure rate was initially about 6%, but now they've got a couple of years data behind them. The, the failure rate is more like 20%. Um, more facts like this on uh, ms-uk.org um, I'll put a link down in the description for you they've got a, a, a nice technical page which it's, it's, which I will link to I saw it feature on breakfast uh, news TV um, and my wife said you need to get around it um, but I just didn't know how to do it um, I spoke to my MS nurse later I mean this was two years ago um, and it was in its experimental stage um, and then last year I spoke to my MS nurse and she said you just have to get referred and um, so I spoke to the consultant got my referral um, and then began the, the, the quest to get this HSCT thing done so as I said uh, HSCT is not a cure um, it doesn't repair any of the scarring that MS leaves um, but it should hopefully uh, stop the progression it should kill the cells stop the progression <laughs> I'm gonna need to look for this one hold on let me try and pronounce this uh, he hematopoietic stem cell transplant <laughs> is where the stem cells are taken from the body uh, the body is then nuked with uh, chemotherapy and, and some other bits and bobs to kill all of the immune, sy immune system uh, and then the immune system is reintroduced as such with the stem cells put back in, they turn back into white blood cells, the immune system is reintroduced. In theory, completely reset, like as a baby, um, so you can start again as new. You'd have thought that the clever science scientists and their science magic would uh, somehow culture the stem cells to behave themselves when they're reintroduced, but sadly that's not the case. Um, people who are genetically predisposed, which I think I might be, uh, to MS, um, can potentially get the MS back again, which is a bit of a bummer. Once reintroduced, the uh, stem cells take about a year to regrow and there's loads of things you can't do. Th th things like um, go swimming in a public bath, or which makes sense because there's bacteria and stuff floating around. Um, and this sounds really sensible to other people, it just didn't occur to me. And you can't do things like gardening because there's stuff like bacteria in the soil. Did you know you can find arsenic in soil? Jesus. Also, leading up to and no, yes, leading up to sort of uh, and definitely afterwards, you've got to follow um, some fairly strict rules. Uh, one of which is you've got to eat like a pregnant lady, so no raw eggs or takeouts. Uh, I broke that rule very, very quickly. Um, other things like you can't go swimming, uh, that's fairly obvious, but it didn't quite occur to me, again, because I'm just not thinking these things through. Um, the, the reason I mentioned the arsenic in the soil was um, I did quite a lot of gardening when I, when I finished the, the HSCT, got out, got some vitamin D, yeah, brilliant, um, started just sort of picking at bits in the soil and doing a little bit of weeding here and there and then read on uh, a Facebook group that uh, no, you, you really can't do that. I presume that maybe the particles from the soil sort of float through the air and you breathe them in and then 
Daniel done for. Also, uh, viruses like chickenpox uh, and that kind of stuff can stay inside the body even after chemotherapy. Um, they bury themselves well deep. So potentially they can re-emerge and attack the, the brand new baby immune system that doesn't know how to cope with it. The old one was programmed, it, it, it dealt with chicken pox, so if it reoccurred then it could deal with it easily, but the new immune system wouldn't have a clue. So you have to take antiviral drugs for about a year afterwards uh, to uh, get rid of those. The patient would then have to have his jabs again, you know, like the MMR, the mumps, measles, rubella, whatever the jab is nowadays, uh, you'd have potentially have to have those again. Um, unless you're an anti-vaxxer. Anti-vaxxers are people who refuse to take these jabs uh, and potentially leave uh, the, the, uh, the very young, the elderly, the weak, like I was for a little while, um, open to attack from these diseases that potentially they can carry. Selfish. A bit of research later, um, and I managed to get a referral to a guy called Dr. Silver up in London. Um, he required my MRI scans, so I got a scan, um, but because it was private, you have to extract it from the NHS, which at the time involved getting CDs or DVDs and going over to, uh, so from Hastings, going over to Eastbourne to get, get the scans and all sorts of things. Nowadays, you just download it from the NHS, just send some ID in and they send you a link and then you can download what you need to um, and then I you know forward it on to whoever needs it from there um, I'll, I'll put a link in the description for that um, but later I'm going to produce a little video about it digressed again um, took my CD to Dr Silver he had a good look through it um, but he saw no progression. He saw no active MS at the time, um, which in a way I was quite disappointed about. I mean, in theory, yay, there's no progression going on, but I thought, yeah, none at this point in time that you can see. Um, and I still wanted the HSCT, so I was quite disappointed at the time. Um, later, uh, I had a, an appointment with a guy called Professor Liu, um, trying to uh, last ditch attempt, crying out, because um, my eyes were going again. Um, so I went to see him if there was anything he could do. Um, he looked at my eyes, apparently I've got really good eyes. Um, the only problem is the connection between my eyes and my brain um, has been attacked and eaten away by MS. So my eyesight's on its way out. Um, anywho, uh, Professor Liu said, why don't you get a second opinion? Which didn't occur to me at the time. I thought it was just something that happens in, in ER on, you know, on, on the telly. Um, yeah, didn't occur to me. So looked for a second opinion. So uh, that was back in June. Um, and by now it's September. Um, and I've been referred to... Doctor, uh, what was his name? The guy off the telly, not Dr. Kazmi. Wait, I managed to get my second opinion. I was referred to a guy called Dr. Malik. Um, same name as a guy off uh, Holby. Anyway, uh, he found some blushing in my scan, which I think is like a really low level amount of activity. Um, but either way, it was still active, so HSCT was still on. Um, so, a little bit later on, uh, I got referred to Dr. Kazmi, who was the, the blood guy, um, and having discussed with, it, with him for a while, um, he reckoned I could be in the system by Christmas. So it was all looking good. It was September, 
Um, they reckon I was going to be in the system by Christmas, so in November I went to get my stem cell harvested, um, which was great news. Uh, getting my stem cells harvested involved going up to London, um, having a bag of chemotherapy pumped into me, uh, which in theory would scare the um, bone marrow into producing extra stem cells. Um, that combined with my, me self-injecting some growth hormone of some sort to also encourage it, um, built up my stem cells ready for harvest. A week later, I went back and got my stem cells harvested, which involved, uh, it's about three hours sitting in a bed, involved being hooked up to a machine where the blood left one arm, went through the machine, uh, which had a centrifuge in it, uh, and then pumped back into my other arm. So the machine would extract the stem cells and put the rest of the blood back in my system. In my mind, this is how it works. So blood comes out of me, goes into the machine. Um, the centrifuge is something that spins uh, the contents of w whatever it is, in this case the blood, um, which is sort of like increasing gravity. So if you had a cup, a, a glass of say muddy water and you let it sit for, I don't know, a, an hour or however long it takes, it would eventually separate into the different layers. So there would be water on the top, maybe silt underneath it, bit of sand underneath that, some small gravel underneath that, but the layers would, would slowly sort themselves out, slowly, because of normal gravity. But inside a centrifuge, because it's spinning, a little bit like when you're young and you sit on one of those playground um, uh, roundabouts, um, the gra gravity's increased because you're, you're spinning. So the whole thing happens just a bunch faster. Uh, the Red blood cells are the heaviest. Uh, the white blood cells, the stem cells, uh, are the second heaviest. They're somewhere in the middle. Uh, and then the, the lightest of all of it is plasma. So the blood in the centrifuge is separating out. Um, and through science and magic, the, <laughs> the white blood cells are scooped out. So have a look at this diagram. I've sort of tried to explain it this way. Uh, have a look at this photo. This is the machine. Um, you can see that it's got three scooping methods as such. One for the plasma, one for the white blood cells, and one for the red blood cells. Please remember I said in my mind. So this is probably reasonably accurate, but you're going to want to look up the details if you want to know the real story. You've got to produce four million stem cells to, to pass. Um, I didn't quite make it. I, I did something like 3.1 on the first go, um, but went back the second day and produced 5.1 million blood cells. So in theory, I produced two bags worth, but anyway, over two days. Um, and then my stem cells went off, got cryogenically frozen um, and kept for when I did my transplant. I eventually started my uh, treatment in March, which unfortunately meant that I was without my disease-modifying drugs, um, Abagio, for, uh, what is it, three months plus the extra six weeks that there was the, the delay. Um, so it was that four and a half months without any protection. My health went downhill quite a lot um, and I was quite weak by the time I started the therapy but that's for another video. A couple of weeks after the uh, the chemotherapy my hair started to fall out which loads of people wouldn't like but actually weirdly I was quite looking forward to and I enjoyed just being bald. Um, have a look at the photo, try not to be too scared, I'm not a lizard man <laughs> but yeah I enjoyed being bald for that time. Leading up to the, uh, the process, people kept asking me, how are you feeling? Are you worried? Are you scared? Um, I took the ignorant route. 
um, and didn't particularly find out what I was supposed to be feeling um, and what the process actually involved. Um, so I was relatively calm leading up to it. Obviously, I listened to the doctors and nurses as they described it, um, but kind of filtered out the, the dodgy bits of information and just held on to the things that I had to do. You know, when, when was the next appointment? Um, what did I need to inject myself with? Uh, whatever was actually medically required, but just don't think about the extra bits. So that concludes my uh, video on setting up for HSCT um, and what it's about. Uh, I hope you found it interesting or useful. I'll do the video for HSCT, the actual treatment, next. Um, but for now, take it easy uh, and stay tuned by clicking subscribe um, and make sure you've clicked the bell so you get notified instantly when the video happens. <laughs> um, it won't be for a little while because I'm quite busy, uh, but hopefully within a couple of, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, uh, I'll have the video done.